I am very privileged today. I have never been in a room with so many crownies. <laughs> so it's a first for me. <laughs> it's a first for me to I address many many groups. I think I would like to get a very good photograph of of, of this particular one. Uh, it is not my usual <laughs> my usual audience. Uh, usually we see you, you know, out there where you are uh, uh, exercising statecraft and, and we are sitting down. So to be here addressing you is, I think, quite a momentous uh, occasion and a very important occasion. My task is actually quite simple because you being Mashinani people, uh, I think it is very easy for you to connect with why um, uh, universal health care and access uh, to you health is, is important in the lives of people, as uh, exemplified by the uh, story that uh, C.S. Uh, Debra just told. So mine is really, I've been asked, I was tasked to connect the dots with our broader bottom-up economic transformation agenda. Why is health sitting there in our five pillars? We know health is important, but we don't think of it as economic. We think of it as social, perhaps. So why health sits among those economic pillars like agriculture and micro-enterprises and digital uh, transformation and housing may at first look odd. But once I explain why it's sitting there, I think it will just emphasize and re-emphasize why it is so important and that this is probably one of the most transformational and consequential initiatives that this administration will do and potential legacy for President William Ruto for Kenya. Uh, so I will begin also with a bit of a story, but not quite a story. Kenya, there's a paradox. Our country is a bit of a paradox. When you look at our country, uh, it looks very developed relative to um, other, in a relative speaking, to our neighbors and African countries. We are seen as one of uh, Africa, a very sort of leading economies. Um, we look very developed if you're in Nairobi. If you look at some of our statistics and parameters, investments, all sorts of things, uh, it looks very developed. Um, and physically, if you look at just visually, uh, it really looks like an upper middle income country if you compare with, with many other countries. Uh, we also do not have the history of some of the challenges that many of other African countries have had. Uh, we haven't had political upheaval, uh, conflict, coups. Yeah, so we've been relatively peaceful country since independence and we look relatively developed. But when you look at the real development outcomes objectively, when you go to objective development outcomes, even within Africa, we are in the bottom half of real development outcomes. Uh, we have a very high incidence of poverty, which has been stuck at around 40%. Uh, yet you see countries with much lower growth, much uh, less human capital and all the other things, uh, much better. I'll give an example. A country like, uh, uh, and talk about like, let's talk about like basic things like food security. If you go and check food security statistics around the world, we are bottom 20% in terms of food security. Or rather, we are one of the most food insecure countries, even in Africa. If you look at a country like Ghana, which has had coups, conflicts, all sorts of things, uh, I think the population that is food insecure is less than 5%. In Kenya, 
one out of five Kenyans, 20% of the population, is chronically undernourished. Yeah? It's not a good statistic, uh, particularly when you look at children. Um, we hear a lot about economic growth all the time, but this growth does not seem uh, to translate to prosperity for the majority. So there's a paradox there, a country which appears and has all the visible sort of, uh, you can see the form of what you might call development, but you don't see the substance of it. So where is the disconnect between the form that you see and the substance? That story, now connects me with uh, President William Ruto. About um, three years ago, or three and a half years ago, I had never met him. We, we had reached out, we had talked on the phone a couple of times, but I'd never met him until three years ago, even when we had the same kind of political circles. And he was obviously going to run for president. Uh, so we uh, sort of reached out to me and we had a conversation. And one of the first things he said in that conversation, and he reached out to me, uh, is to say something. I think he said, you know, I have now accepted, I have accepted that there is something wrong with our economic model. Because we keep doing these things, we keep doing these development things as jubilee, during Kibaki, we did many, many things we thought we had transformed, they were transforming the country under jubilee, we have done this, we have done all manner of things, build infrastructure, we thought we have been transforming the country, but we don't seem to have moved. So, why is it that uh, you have so much activity around development, but it is not translating to substantive change uh, that among the people? Why is, why is it that we've done so much, we've done invested, we've done harambees for hospitals, we've built level five, level six hospitals, but when I look at my phone, it is full of uh, harambees for medical bills, or people sort of huge amount of distress, uh, despite us doing all this development, among other things, the questions, issues I've said about food security. So that conversation went on, and then uh, has sort of it, it continues today. Said so yes, there is something fundamentally wrong with our economic model. And that thing is called trickle-down economics. Trickle-down economics is an ideology that believes that prosperity is created at the top by a few people and then it trickles down to, to the masses. Where did we get that ideology? We got that ideology from our colonial legacy. Because if you think about Kenya, our colonial state, and particularly as a settler colony, unlike other countries like Tanzania and others which are protectorates and in direct rule, if you think about a settler colony, what the settlers did, the colonial did here, it came and created an enclave society around the settler economy. Yeah? An enclave around the settler economy which essentially was to serve the, the settlers. Those of you out there in the countryside can begin to relate to what I'm saying. And so the people in that enclave economy 
in society are those people associated with the state and the settler economy. Yeah. So if you are working in the administration like yourselves, or if the few people who are educated and you are required as a clerk, or something like that. Yeah. So you end up with a system which is like almost like a closed system for a few and it leaves everybody else behind. Yeah? And if you look at all our institutions, that is the legacy of our institutions. These institutions are designed around a formal economy and structure. Those, that's where it looks developed. But most of the people the pastoralists and the fisher folk and all other people out there are not part of it. Yeah? So, what has happened over time, you start with that system, you have at independence a population of only 6 million people. Uh, it includes maybe only 1 million people are in that system. Five million are out there as smallholder farmers and pastoralists and fisher folk. And five billion people can support themselves reasonably with the resources, land and other resources that are available. But when you get to 60 million people, it is very easy, difficult to, ex that system cannot accommodate that many people, but it's very difficult to exclude 50 million people. And also the resources out there are not sufficient to support 50 million people. And at any rate, uh, because of education and healthcare interventions, those people do not have expectations that they will remain pastoralists and smallholder farmers and fisher folk forever. Yet, the structure you have at the top isn't built to accommodate that many people. So you find that today, and I want to make this connection, we have a workforce of about 19 million people, and the economy we call private sector in Kenya, yeah? the economy we call private sector, what I'm calling trip go down, only employs 2 million people. The public sector employs another 1 million, so that's 3 million, 3.5 three million people. Those three and a half million people, that leaves how many people? 16 million people. Who are those? They are Uko Mashinani, smallholder farmers, uh, Juakali, informal sector, in the micro and small enterprise sector. Now, our system is not designed, institutions are not designed to include those people. So let's take uh, health. If you look at the health system, that we inherited, it assumed that all those people would be catered for by public hospitals, dispensaries, and health centers out there. And then we created a health insurance only for employed people. So the NHIF was created primarily for people because if you look at the way it is funded, it is funded from payroll deduction. So if you are not on a payroll, you are considered, you are outside the system. You don't need health insurance. Yours is to go to the dispensary uh, for small infectious diseases. But if you have a critical illness, you are on your own. Yeah? So that was then when you had maybe 300,000 people in the formal wage employment when it was created. Uh, but over time, now you have a population and it has grown. Uh, so you find that you have then a healthcare system, if you come to Nairobi, where you have world-class healthcare in private hospitals. In fact, these are hospitals actually serve even the elites from the rest of the region. Yeah? Uh, that is where leaders from the rest of the region are evacuated. It serves international. It's good enough for the UN people who work here and all of that. But the ordinary Kenyan has a little dispensary, Uko, which hardly has drugs. They have to go there if they have a, just a small infectious disease, sit on a form, queue, 
you know, go around, spend the entire morning, um, in which they sort of wasting their, their productivity, uh, trying to get uh, treatment for a simple infectious infection or something like that. So, you find that even when we try to include people, and that's one of the conversations we're having with uh, William Ruto, is how he had tried to enroll people into the NHIF. But the problem is, because they are not on payroll, these people, NHF then created a product for them called voluntary members. Volunt for where you pay 500 shillings per month. But a person who's not on payroll cannot remember to constantly be paying their 500 shillings. So they join, and after two months, they lapse. Then somebody gets sick and they remember, oh, I should have kept my NHIF current. So they have to wait, pay, and then now they try and access healthcare. What that causes is a problem where now the only people who are enrolled are the people who are sick. <laughs> because we call that in health economics adverse election. So that uh, you're only joining, yet an insurance is supposed to ensure everybody pulls money uh, so that uh, the, the actual cost, whatever is low, it becomes, it doesn't work. It is not fit for purpose. So, you find the same. Think about social security, NSSF. It is only for people who are payroll. If you are out there, you are a mechanic in uh, this country, even if you have a high income, there is no mechanism for you to, to easily uh, save for retirement. The consequence of that is that you have then ended up and with something a very high, uh, what do you call, a crisis of catastrophic health expenditure shocks. According to a study carried not too long ago, I think I, the data is about 50, uh, 2018 when you had uh, research, it showed one million Kenyans in that year when that survey was uh, carried fall into poverty because of a health, a, 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 what you call a health shock. Somebody gets sick, okay, and when they get sick, then the household, because they don't have health insurance, and they are not employed, so if you are an employee, like yourselves, if somebody gets sick, even if it's yourself or somebody, one, you have a health cover, two, you get leave, you get sick leave, and you continue, and you get so you covered in terms of health care, and you are on sick leave, so you are getting an income. Now, if you are self-employed, if you are in Juakali out there, self-employed as a Kenyan, what happens? One, you can't work. Yeah? Because nobody gives you leave from your kiosk. True? There's no leave from your kiosk, so you close your kiosk or whatever small business you are doing. Then, you need to pay for health. So, you take the the money which was running the business. You take the working capital and it is consumed by, by illness. So, one million Kenyans every year fall into poverty because of a health shock in the family. That's about 250,000 households out of a total of uh, 12, 12 and a half million households. So, Kenya, poverty cannot go down. <laughs> if you have a large, if you have 85% of your workforce is self-employed and they are exposed to health shocks, yeah, it means that the health shock not only affects your health, it actually is financially catastrophic for that particular household. And if it is financially catastrophic, that is why even those businesses will not go. And that's why we are get stuck. We get stuck treading water. Because people are trying to get in the health. So you are a
you are progressing kidogo you get sick or somebody gets sick then you sell the cow yeah once you sell the cow <laughs> you are back to yeah so health expenditures health shocks is one of the biggest cause actually it is the biggest not one of the biggest it's actually established it is one of the it is the biggest cause of business failure it is the biggest cause of people falling into poverty and it is the biggest cause of keeping poor people poor and this is the scientific let me let's take a re, uh, give you an example think about uh, nyanza and western lake region now lake region has very good land it has high rainfall yeah it has all the for an agricultural country it has high agricultural potential why is it why does it have very high incidence of poverty one thing only who can guess what it is why does the lake region have a high incidence of poverty despite what is visibly a high agricultural potential one thing only even within ill health somebody is whispering the right thing malaria high incidence of malaria what does malaria do one you know about malaria is very so very high incidence every if you go there you will find uh, every other household has somebody who has malaria true now if somebody has malaria they cannot work okay now if that's a sort of a bread anna they are not working you see they don't they are not they are not given sick leave from their shop or from the farm okay if it is planting season you don't have the income even to buy inputs okay then that person probably needs somebody to care for them so another person is the household workforce to take care of the sick person okay you are taking what does agriculture need labor it needs labor and so the, the resources of the household that are also needed for inputs and whatever so that region suffers from a malaria poverty trap again healthcare so we sat down as i said and as we were discussing and narrowing down the things we needed to do with uh, william ruto uh, president then he was candidate health became very important we said then we must be able to take on this beast called health and make sure that everybody and when you do the math the statistics bear you out these people will tell you if you look at our total health expenditure we spent the last time i think the last data we have which is about 2 years ago 150 billion shillings out of pocket health expenditure yeah and that incidence it not only affects those people who are at the bottom as we are talking about because even people who are not every so often not every so often because we are families we have extended families uh, they are also being financed by other people so it is taking money out of businesses out of when you are talking to cooperatives last week about this and uh, providing finance for universal health care for the uh, onboarding uh, people into shift the cooperatives told us sacos in fact we have been talking about this for a very long time and we were even considered how we can start our own health insurance for sacos why did sacos think that they should consider starting health insurance can you guess of 
where would circles where would that problem become such a so visible to circles actually the answer is the biggest reason for people liquidating their circle savings yeah or defaulting on their loans is health shocks if somebody has put money in their circle uh, they uh, forever and they come and say look i need to cash out my circle why or oh, my mom is sick we need to take her to india so we are uh, whatever in the family and the only money i have is the money in the in the circle so circles begin asking what can we do to uh, because why else would there is other reasons you could persevere and say that keep savings but if it is your own health or the health of your loved one a spouse a child a parent then i think that is a no choice situation so you have to you have sold the one has sold the cow you liquidate your circle you sell the car you can always buy that one later and deal with with the health situation so it's all around us you can see the connection between so even if you are trying to support agriculture yeah health shocks are pulling us down you are trying to support small businesses health shocks are pulling us down yet the infrastructure we have the only thing it can provide for people who are not on payroll because it is a legacy system of that colonial structure i have talk about it could come up with was we cannot determine these people's incomes we don't know what they are they earn so let's put a flat 500 bob so whether somebody is a juakali mechanic or a rich businessman all of you pay 500 shillings so it is actually not and that's because the system so what we sat down and we sat for a long time is to try and figure out how can we design a system which is designed for our society as is not one which we are inheriting and just copy and paste from western countries where everybody is employed by a big company, by a big organization because we are an economy of self employed people so we have to design a system which works for us not copy one which we tried we have tried to plug it in plug it people patch it up in the end we said you know what let us just put this thing there and start from scratch so we sat down with dr moth here and other people and started thinking how do we actually design and perhaps this is the journey we should have started Uh, many many years ago saying how do we design institutions and structures and economic system which works for our economy the way it is not one which picks a few people and says the ones who are in suits and uh, whatever else and design and just ca- copy and paste the western systems which can fit those people alafu wao wengine the rest of the kenyans who are fishing are our tajipanga Yeah, they are too their lives are too complicated <laughs> you try and fit them in this system their lives are too complicated one of the things which is really helping us to do that is digital because digital uh, technology now allow us to reach people to connect people irrespective of where they are many of you you remember some of you no maybe not many not as many uh, you know sometimes we forget some of us now are no longer <laughs> vijana <laughs> and we are on the other side uh, of 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 whatever but uh, would remember when banking was only for the elite if you, for you to have a bank account you are a very important person in society yeah the ordinary people they dealt with cash many of you remember when only senior officers in government or uh, private sector had a telephone in the house 
In fact, it used to be one or two people in the whole community and the people who needed to make calls had to come and queue there <laughs> to the person who owns a telephone. What digital uh, technology has done is universalize these technologies. And now they enable us to leverage on this kind of technology so that you officers can onboard six million farmers onto a digital platform and enable us to deliver that fertilizer subsidy at the touch of a button. So he said, even in health, what enables us to now be able to universalize our healthcare system is to use leverage on that digital technology. Because digital technology does not discriminate whether you are informal, whether you are a pastoralist, whether you are, it doesn't discriminate. You are now able to uh, connect the connectivity with every Kenyan. You do not need to be in a formal institution for us to be able to, to uh, plan and whatever. And we've already started in the healthcare. I think many of you will have interacted with the community health promoters. We have built that digital platform. It is now possible for this doctor sitting here to tell you today how many people have been visited by uh, CHPs. They have been, uh, they have taken their blood pressure and their sh blood sugar, and how many people have been referred for further investigation potentially for diabetes or, um, or, 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 uh, or high blood pressure or, or hypertension. Now, that capability, that capability means that person, that old person who has, uh, that parent or whoever, who has been investigated and uh, for diabetes, that is probably uh, a kidney disease averted. That person who has been uh, investigated and referred for hypertension, it is heart disease averted. It's a heart uh, disease averted. So with, very, with that capability then enable us to bring the quality of health care, world class quality of health care to that person. In fact, probably better than many, many other places, including developed countries in the world. It allows us to, be, to begin to close that gap. So that is the opportunity, and not only opportunity, but imperative. Why this is so important? It is so important because in terms of health care cost, if you can avert that case of that person, and now we are moving to a case where society is also aging, so that you are shifting to about moving from a burden of infectious diseases to what these people here call non-communicable diseases. And once you move to non-communicable diseases, the, the kidney, the heart, the kidneys, all those the cancers, the burden of catastrophic expenditures become even heavier. Very, very heavier. So it is very important that we take this action now uh, and we put everybody in one pool, one insured system, one provision system, because that burden, when that burden happens and that person needs to go to India and they need five million shillings, all of us have to, how will have to put that money. And that money is we are taking out of other economic activity. The disease burden and the financial cost of that disease burden might actually overwhelm us uh, economically. So we are not going to make economic progress until we solve our healthcare financing problem, healthcare financing challenge. That is the message. So people are going to ask lots of questions. Why do we have to pay more uh, for this social health insurance where we can get social health insurance, uh, private health insurance somewhere else? That is the problem we have had in this country where we have a small group of people who are able to provide for themselves in that enclave that I talked about of a small privileged economy. You think you have left everybody else behind. You think it is not your problem. But in fact, what it does is that it drags all of us down. 
it, it is keeping us down because you cannot live behind 55 million people. You cannot have a prosperous economy. You cannot transform this economy and society by having only 2 million or 3 million people in the formal economy with institutions designed around those people living behind the other 55 million Kenyans. I think that's